For thousands of years, the universe has been studied by examining the light arriving at the Earth from the stars, gas clouds, and galaxies. In the past three decades, however, technology has given us the tools to capture and interpret other forms of electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, X-rays, infrared radiation, and gamma rays. These all provide information on regions of the universe that are invisible to our eyes. The Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory was established in 1959 to explore the universe using radio techniques. It is located at White Lake, a short distance from the city of Penticton, British Columbia. Some radio astronomy began immediately after the World War where uh, people with sensitive radar sets uh, looked at the sun accidentally and saw great bursts of uh, radio emission. And uh, so uh, it was a logical thing to do for people whose skills were in electric, electronic engineering to uh, turn their attention to the sky instead of to uh, enemy bombers. <laughs> yeah. Big telescope was built in 1959 and uh, first observations made in that year, but the official opening wasn't until 1960. And uh, the uh, initial uh, receivers that we had were very crude compared to what we have now, but uh, we were able to uh, measure a number of sources in our galaxy and uh, map some regions of the sky rather crudely compared to modern standards, but uh, we got started in 59 and 60. The staff was gradually uh, built up. Uh, uh, I was uh, in England uh, just before the uh, observatory was established and came back uh, early in 59 when uh, the telescope was being built. Uh, Carmen Costain was in Cambridge uh, also studying radio astronomy and he came uh, later in that year. Ed Argyle came from the the observatory in Victoria. He had been in optical astronomy. And Jack Locke came from Ottawa. Uh, he was uh, the head of the Stellar Physics Division at the time, and uh, this was one of their major projects. So he was here for three years or so. The observatory was chosen to get a large area that was uh, free of radio interference. Now, one couldn't do radio astronomy in a city, of course, because there's too much uh, electrical activity and uh, so we looked for an area uh, we wanted it as far south as possible so that we could see the southern sky and we wanted it away from the auroral zone which is around Hudson's Bay because for some observations the aurora would cause pro problems so uh, we looked for sites in southern British Columbia uh, and this appeared to be the best site both from the point of view of uh, interference and uh, the fact that there was a town or city nearby where people could live. There are many reasons, but the main reason was that it was a large area surrounded by hills that uh, was virtually uh, unused for any interfering type of uh, activities. There was ranching and farming and so on, but uh, nothing that would cause radio interference. Radio waves are uh, similar to uh, other waves that we can see, the light waves for instance, uh, or uh, heat radiation which we can feel with our hands or our cheeks, uh, but they have different wavelengths. Uh, wavelengths of radio waves are very long and wavelengths of light are very short and uh, heat waves and microwaves are somewhere in between. And uh, But it's, it's all the same, can be treated with the same mathematics and to some extent is generated in the same way. Thermal motions, for instance, uh, can uh, uh, cause collisions which cause the atoms to uh, interchange electrons or, and generate radio waves. Uh, the uh, specific uh, stuff we call line radiation is caused by uh, electrons uh, changing their position or changing their energy states in an atom. And uh, in the case of hydrogen, this doesn't happen very often, but the, there's so much space and so many atoms out in space that uh, 
they generate enough power that a big radio telescope can, can actually observe it. And so we're able to map the galaxy, map the hydrogen in the galaxy by pointing the telescope around in the galaxy to different, different positions. The I, original idea was to study the gas clouds of hydrogen in our own Milky Way or in our own galaxy. And uh, to a large extent that's still what we're doing, but we have expanded to uh, study them uh, at much greater detail with much better equipment than we had originally. The large antenna arrays that uh, you have seen here are uh, no longer in use, and they were used for several years uh, to map the whole sky, but uh, it, it wasn't a case of mapping the sky in the uh, emission of hydrogen. Now, the hydrogen atom emits a specific frequency for which the Big Dish and the Synthesis Telescope are tuned, uh, but uh, the uh, continuum emission uh, is over the whole spectrum and we wanted to sample it at as many different frequencies as possible. Nobody else had observed the low frequency end of the spectrum, so we built those big antennas to do that. One of them's no longer there. There was a 22 megahertz array, which is still standing but not in use, and a 10 megahertz array, which uh, was dismantled shortly after it finished its job. But the, uh, the idea was to to find out what the sky looked like at these low frequencies. Now, the, the frequencies were 10 megahertz and 22 megahertz, and these were the about the lowest frequencies that anyone had ever built uh, large antennas for before. The 26 meter telescope is used for uh, augmenting the uh, observations done on the synthesis telescope. Uh, the synthesis telescope uh, is designed to get very fine resolution to see small detail in the sky and the radio sources we're studying. But it can't see the coarse detail because it's not possible to move those small dishes close together because they'll bang into each other. Or in other cases, they'll shadow each other. So the low order spacings that cannot be obtained from the synthesis telescope are made with the big antenna here. and. Uh, that might be 15 or 20 percent of the time of the uh, uh, of the antenna, uh, but the other parts of the uh, the other times it's used for uh, some studies of hydrogen, but also studies of the OH molecule. One atom of oxygen and one atom of hydrogen are sometimes called hydroxyl, and there are four radio lines uh, at 16, 60. 5 megahertz and thereabouts that, uh, that we're studying, that we're observing one of them now. And uh, we're looking at uh, regions where uh, uh, this uh, OH molecule emits, sometimes quite strongly. There are uh, maser uh, type emissions where it emits in a very narrow line and uh, other regions where the emission is broader. At the moment we're mapping a region uh, which was studied at other molecules and other observatories, but has never been studied in this detail uh, at this particular frequency. It wouldn't be useful if it still had the electronics it had back in the early 60s, because uh, w it wasn't flexible, it wasn't computer compatible, and uh, it required human beings to uh, direct it and humans make mistakes and so on. But the, uh, the advent of uh, microelectronics and uh, low noise amplifiers have uh, given it a new lease on life, you might say. We originally had mostly vacuum tubes in our receivers and then we had some transistors but now almost all integrated circuits are used. We ask people to walk in rather than drive in because uh, cars generate interference and uh, uh, if this telescope were beside a, a highway or even a, uh, an area where there was a lot of uh, human activity, there would be far more interference. So that's why we're isolated. Uh, satellite interference is important. Some of it uh, is uh, a case of uh, uh, sloppy engineering in the, uh, uh, the 
part of the satellite engineer's design. Uh, there are spurious emissions which are outside the band allocated to the satellites themselves, which are in occur in the radio astronomy band, and these have caused us great, great efforts, great difficulties. Uh, another problem is uh, a case of uh, we wanting to observe a particular frequency because that's where the atom emits, and uh, it's been assigned to some other service. And uh, in the case of navigational satellites, this is uh, a very important problem because one of the most interesting uh, most important lines is assigned to uh, navigation and their navigation satellites up there so sometimes we lose as much as 50 percent of our observations to to these satellites it was fine before any satellites went up because uh, didn't we you see we are not transmitting we're only receiving and we're far more sensitive to uh, small amounts of power than any of the communication uh, our entertainment industries are because we integrate for a long long time maybe for a whole day and we have very sensitive receivers and very big antennas so uh, it's sometimes hard to uh, uh, make the engineers understand our problems where they s they're not interfering with each other so they think everything's all right but as far as we're concerned it's not We have a fairly big expansion project underway. We've increased the number of antennas in the telescope from four to seven. They're still within the 600 meter baseline of the original telescope. But as we'll have several uh, effects, first of all, it'll make the telescope faster. We'll be able to make these images three times as quickly. Um, secondly, we'll be able to make better quality images. We'll be able to get the information that, that the astronomers want out of the telescope uh, more easily by exploiting the larger number of antennas. And thirdly, we're increasing the sensitivity of the telescope by some things that you can't see here but you can see inside by improvements uh, in the electronics and in the signal processing and in the, in the computer information processing. It's been quite a long process, the, the expansion, because we've tried to keep the telescope operating as long as possible, providing data for, for scientific uh, investigations while we're going on with, with the improvements. And you can think of that uh, in a way as uh, trying to do a major heart surgery on somebody who's still at work. Uh, so it is a tricky operation. We are really replacing a lot of equipment inside the building over there in the, in the back end of the telescope. But that's nothing new for us. Well, we're used to constantly upgrading the telescope. And in the, in the 30 years that this observatory has been here, the sensitivity has increased by a factor of a thousand. And that's through exploiting new technologies and particularly exploiting computer information processing and, and applying those technologies to, to our telescope. Well, the antennas are mirrors. They, the curved surface reflects incoming radio waves and they're collected by a little receiver at the top of the tripod, you can see there. What's in that, that white box up there is very similar in principle to an ordinary radio re receiver you would have at home. It's a little more sensitive and it's tuned to a special wavelength, special frequency that's, that's allocated just for radio astronomy. And the signals there are, are made stronger by the amplifiers and then sent down the cables into the central building. The telescope works by gathering signals from the individual antennas and bringing them together at a central point. It's not just size that matters, it's area. We're collecting very feeble signals from, from the universe, from the depths of space, and the bigger the antenna, the more signal you collect. You might uh, think of an analogy if you're collecting rainwater from the roof, and the bigger the roof, the more rainwater you collect.
Well, so the bigger our antennas are, the more sensitivity we have. Well, our telescope works in two frequency bands simultaneously, and both those receivers are installed at the focus of each antenna all the time. So we don't do any changing. We're actually observing on, on two channels, if you like, uh, at the same time. The idea is that we want to get telescope very much bigger than, than a, a single mirror, a single reflector can be built. The, uh, the reason we want um, such a large telescope is, is twofold. First, I've already explained we need the collecting area, we need to get the sensitivity, but we need a large telescope in order to see the sky in detail. And we need a telescope that's much larger than anything we can build. So we solve that by putting a lot of small telescopes together into one. That's the, the principle of aperture synthesis that this telescope works on. Now, we exploit two things. First of all, we move the small antennas along the rail behind me, and at different locations along there, we'll make observations for 12-hour periods. And secondly, we exploit the rotation of the Earth. The rotation of the Earth actually turns this east-west baseline that the antennas are standing on. So in that 12-hour period, one pair of antennas will sweep out an annular ring of the, the big synthetic telescope. What we end up with is the equivalent of uh, a telescope that's 600 meters in diameter. You can imagine a big 600 meter area in the bottom of the valley here, just covered with with little antennas. Well, we don't have them there all at the time. At one time, we um, use the rotation of the Earth to move them in this direction, and then we move them along the tracks to fill in in the other direction. And at the end of a 12-day observing period, all that information, all that data that's been gathered, is reassembled in the computer to make images of patches of the sky. There are, are quite a few telescopes in other parts of the world and in other countries that use this principle, the same principle. Um, ours technically is a bit different in that we have a, a very precise rail track you can see here. Um, the other telescopes tend to drive antennas along roads which are not very precise and then put them down on very precise foundations. Um, we've combined the road and the foundations into one on this track. Just a small technical difference in approach, no difference in principle. But this does let us move from one station to another very quickly. And it takes uh, less than five minutes to move one antenna. And the, the distance we move, the distance between stations on the track is about half the diameter of the antenna, so it's about four and a half meters. As far as we can tell, since in the 20 years this track's been here, nothing's moved. We survey the track day after day, in a sense, um, using astronomical sources, that the telescope measures its own position, checks its own position. This is the place where the signals come in to the building from the antennas, and they're brought in here on these black cables, coaxial cables. And as well, you can see a lot of coloured wiring in this rack where control signals go out to the antennas. I'm going to turn on this amplifier so that you can hear what the signals sound like. That's not very exciting. There are no voices, there's no music, just a hissing sound. And that's the signal which the kind of signal which comes to us from the sky. Well, we're bringing signals in from antennas spread out over the, the long distance, the baseline of 600 meters. And one of the things we have to worry about is the length of the cables between here and each antenna. So the equipment in these three racks has the job of stabilizing the length of those cables. Each cable is about 400 meters long and we have to stabilize its length to about one millimeter. 
and that that is quite a lot of precision. We need to send signals over the cables out to each antenna in order to keep those lengths very precise. Then eventually we bring the signals together. We take signals from the different antennas and multiply them together in equipment here. Um, this rack contains equipment that we used to use for this purpose, but we've now replaced that with a digital device which I'll show you inside later. Um, we go on amplifying the signals here, building them up in strength and filtering and defining the, the signals before we take them into the computer room for the multiplication process. Well, when we're observing in the east or in the western part of the sky, the signals coming in from the sky will strike one antenna before the others. And we have to put delays into the path of each signal so that they arrive at the correlator, at the multiplier, at the same instant. And these boxes down here each contain about 600 metres of coaxial cable in little pieces. And as the observing session wears on, the computer controls the total length of cable between the input and the output. And it does it by switching little pieces of cable into place. In this other rack over here, we have the equipment which controls the, the cable. Um, the computer puts out a number which I can simulate by using these switches. If I flip this switch, the delay system will switch in a medium length piece of cable. That's about uh, 40 meters. And if I flip this switch, it switches in a very short piece of cable, about 16 centimeters. And the computer assembles the number that's required to produce the required um, length of cable. These switches, of course, are here just for testing. Um, when we're observing, we switch the operation from manual to computer, and the computer takes over control. The computer and the digital equipment that operate the telescope are kept inside this cage. It's a, in politer terms, a screened room. If you look at the big door here, you'll see there are actually two quite separate layers of copper. And we need that because the digital equipment makes radio noise, just like the signals that come to us from the sky. And if we're not careful, our own equipment will drown out the kinds of things we're trying to pick up from the sky. And we have to be very, very careful to keep everything bottled up. I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, what happens in this room here. I'm basically responsible for most of the electronics that you see behind me. Um, the, the signals when they are picked up from the dishes get uh, mixed down to a lower frequency in the outside of the screen room here and then they're brought inside here where, they, uh, where a couple of things happen to them. The first thing that happens is these signals are digitized so that a computer or digital electronics can, can manipulate these numbers. Behind me you'll see basically two types of equipment. Special purpose hardware called correlators which basically multiply the signals from a pair of antennas together and then special purpose microcomputers which uh, control these correlators and then a big central computer which gathers the data from the various microcomputers and stores the information that these microcomputers provide on a magnetic disk. Uh, our job here is to do a number of different things. One is to design the hardware that you see and another and program the microcomputers that control this hardware as well as maintain it. And uh, just to give you an example of some of the stuff that we have done around here, this, this circuit board here is an example of something that was done in, in mid-70s, I suppose. And it's a, a, a digital correlator. It's a thing that multiplies the numbers together that come from the various antennas. Uh, some of the more up-to-date technology are, are some of these integrated circuits that we've uh, designed. 
in a at a company in Vancouver, uh, four of these chips would basically replace one of these circuit boards. So we've come a long ways from, say, 1975 to 1990. Um, and over here, we have some instrumentation for programming these micro uh, computers that I mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, the, the microcomputers are, are what are called embedded processors. They control the very time critical uh, aspects of the, uh, of the hardware. And uh, uh, we sometimes have to use very sophisticated equipment to help us program these. And this instrument here is something that does that. And as you can see, I've got some signals that the microcomputer is examining. And uh, I can examine these signals that the microcomputer is looking at with this device here. Uh, this is a very nice device. I can uh, look at various other menus that this machine provides me. And it's uh, quite a sophisticated instrument. I'd like to show you uh, one of these microcomputers. This microcomputer is called our antenna control computer and it uh, controls the positioning of the dishes out on the array and I'm going to enter a new position for these antennas to go to and then after I've done that we'll go outside and, and watch the dishes go into new position. Okay, the dishes are now now have a new uh, position command, which they all all try to uh, move to, and they're gradually beginning to move there. An observation is being set up now on the computer, and this computer screen shows the sequence of events. It's showing the times, and over here, it's showing what's happening. Um, the entire operation of the telescope will be under the control of the computer and we need screens like this to monitor what's happening as a number of computers here are talking to each other and getting ready to initiate the observation and the final message down here is data is being collected. The other screen is used to schedule the observation to tell the computer which sources we want to observe and the sequence in which we want to observe them and how long we want to spend on each one. And we can, we usually set up in this way for something like 24 hours observation, but we can set it up for longer. We can set it up for a, for a whole weekend or we could even set it up for a week, though we don't usually do that. Um, in the process of a 12-day observation, about 32 million individual measurements are made. So you can see that this is a task that's beyond any human observer, something we have to delegate to the computer. With a very high level of automation, of course, um, you can be fooled. The telescope can appear to be working, but not be working at all. and uh, it. Uh, has happened before that we've collected nonsense for a whole night without knowing it. So we've put in um, a record on the paper charts that come out of the computer printer to show us what's going on. Of course we don't use these in the ultimate computation of the images, but at least with a glance at this kind of trace you can see whether the data being collected makes sense or not. And this trace is from an experimental run on the 12th of April. Uh, there's probably about 12 hours of data being collected here out of one of the channels of the telescope. The telescope is collecting a lot more than this, of course, and we can't print out every little bit that it collects, but we have to be able to monitor what's going on in there. Okay, once the data is gathered over by the synthesis telescope, and then it's sent over to this building here, in the main building, into our main computer, 
and stored until a complete survey is done. At the end of that time, you sit down in front of a terminal like this one here, connected to the main computer, call back all the data, and put it together. It's a fairly complex process that takes a long time. I'm talking about days and weeks here to get the image put together and cleaned up satisfactorily so it looks like something uh, decent. What I'm going to do here is just call up one of these images that has been made and show it on the screen behind me. Just connect it to the main computer here. Just a few commands and the image shows up on the screen. And I can enlarge that a little bit. Get a slightly better picture there. And I can play with it here. This is what we actually use this machine for, is to enhance the contrast so we can bring in uh, the faint parts or the brighter parts, depending on what we're interested in. But just to give you some idea of what this image is doing, this is a piece of sky that's two degrees across. That means that this object here would be about the size of the moon in the sky, if you could see it. You can't see this thing with your eyes because this is made from radio waves. This is the chunk of sky as it would look if you had radio eyes. These little dots here are distant quasars and galaxies, and they show up all over the place when you look at the sky with a radio telescope. So they're far in the background. They're millions, hundreds of millions of light years away. And the object we're interested in is this deal here, which is a supernova remnant. And this was the first time that this supernova remnant had been seen in such detail. I'll back off a bit here so you can see the image a little better. When this image first showed up, uh, there was a lot of surprise because of the peculiar shape. A supernova remnant is produced when a star explodes. A massive star gets the end of its life and explodes. A tremendous explosion. And you can see the debris from the explosion expanding in the space. And you might expect something like this as a result of an explosion. And the question came up, well, what's this mushroomy thing looking out here? And the guess was that when the star exploded, it was sitting inside a cloud of gas in interstellar space. It was near the edge of the cloud. And the explosion that fought its way into the cloud is seen here. It's like a bubble being blown into the cloud. And in this direction, the explosion went out into space and expanded much more quickly. So you get the much larger effort here. Well, that was a sort of discussion that went around the uh, coffee table about what was happening with this. I went back and took another look with the telescope, this time getting the information that told us where all the gas was as well, the hydrogen gas, and found that, that that surmise was more or less correct, that there is a big chunk of gas here that was inhibiting the explosion, and empty space out here but the extra thing that was learned from that additional measurement was that over on this side, there is another enormous gas cloud. It's as if this gas in space had a tunnel going through it right there. And the explosion burst out into this tunnel. And over here, where it looks bright on the other side, you're seeing it hit the other side of the tunnel and pump a tremendous amount of energy into that gas there, which is why it looks bright at radio wavelengths. This is a supernova explosion estimated it took place some 20,000, 30,000 years ago. We're just seeing the results of that as the material expands in the space now. Many, many light years across something like this. This thing is uh, a few thousand light years away. Say eight or 10,000 light years of that, in that order. This is the sort of images we're trying to get with the telescope, uh, remembering that it's a fairly big object in the sky. That's about three times the size of the moon right there from one end to the other. So it's a fairly big object and that's what our telescope is good at, is finding these large objects in the sky. And kind of spooky feeling that if you look at the sky you don't see it at all. It's absolutely invisible unless you use a radio telescope. The other thing I might explain on here, I've mentioned that these are background quasars and galaxies. This speckledy stuff here is what we call noise, and it's artifacts introduced by the amplifiers on the telescopes. And the better the amplifier you have, the less of this noise, the speckly stuff you get, which is why you want to have a good amplifier with your radio telescope. 
It means you can see fainter objects without getting messed up with this noise that appears in the image. This is an experiment that I was in, involved in, along with some astronomers from Argentina. And uh, they were interested in a star who, which lives about here, uh, a star which is losing a tremendous amount of material in a, in a wind blowing into all directions in space around it. And they thought it was probable that uh, this star that was losing so much material would be affecting the interstellar medium around it, this very tenuous gas that fills space between the stars, and uh, thought that the, the star might be blowing an enormous bubble in the interstellar medium, and they wanted to look for the bubble. So they came here and we worked together and produced this image, and this image is made from the hydrogen gas in space, the atomic gas, neutral hydrogen gas, cold and dark stuff, which you can't see except with the radio telescope. Again, uh, this is about two degrees across in the sky, so the moon would nicely fit inside that part of the image. Looking at the hydrogen gas, there's an awful lot of it out there, and the picture is often very messy like this, and you have trouble homing in on exactly the object you want. But we found what we believe to be the bubble, which is this chunk of hydrogen here. And you're talking about something which is the order of 100 light years across, so it's a fairly big bubble in space. And the star sits down here. It's a little off-center. And the explanation for that is that the star is moving through space. It takes it a while for it to blow a bubble this big. But the star is moving and has shifted from its central position since it first did this damage to the interstellar medium. And down here, you have hydrogen lurking around the Milky Way, the plane of the galaxy. And this is a little outside the plane of the galaxy. And the gas has been compressed and made visible by the action of this star out there. But enough material in this gas uh, to make, if it was going to collapse and make more stars, it would make uh, over a thousand stars like the Sun. So it's a fair chunk of gas out there. Uh, Radio Astron is part of an international effort to put a uh, uh, microwave receiving dish in space to form a space-based uh, radio telescope. Our part is to develop uh, ground-based equipment which will um, take recorded sample data from the orbiting station and from three ground stations and uh, process it and eventually come up with a uh, what are called correlation results which will eventually be uh, processed by a computer to make an image of a source out in space. Yeah. The major difficulty in this is the fact that a telescope is going to be in space uh, so it is moving at a fairly high velocity, a maximum of 10 kilometers per second. Um, so the computer electronics have to be able to, has to be able to compensate for that and track that. Our role is to build the correlator, which will process um, previously recorded and sampled uh, um, received data. So we'll take raw data and process it into a form that can be used by a, a, a uh, I guess a general purpose computer that will take that what's called UV data and uh, put it into or transform it, do a Fourier transform on it into an actual image. And the image is what astronomer, astronomers will look at to learn more about what we're observing. So that's basically what Canada's role is. So it's a very special special purpose computer, very powerful computer um, we did some calculations and it's actually going to be about 300 and 390 giga operations per section per per second which is 390 million or 390 billion operations per second per second i should point out that the recorded the recording equipment that is going to uh, um, receive data and record it onto magnetic tape um, is being developed by ISTS, the Institute for Space and Terrestrial Science, which is just um, right by York University in Toronto. So they're developing the recording equipment because in VLBI, um, what you do is you have a, a number of very um, widely spaced antennas, like on, on the order of the diameter diameter of the Earth. And with Radio Astron, it could uh, be 77,000 kilometers away from the center of the Earth. And so what you do is you record it on magnetic tape along with a, a lot of very precise timing information. And then you uh, take that tape and you s ship it to a central location. 
and then you play it back, recover all the timing information, line everything up, and then process it at that point. Sure. So that's how you get the picture. So you want, the reason why you want a very large baseline is because the larger your baseline, the higher the resolution of your picture, of your image. If you had a very small baseline, or a smaller baseline, then things that w you look at, they'd just be fuzzy blobs. Well, with Radio Astron, you'd actually be able to look into those fu fuzzy blobs and see what's actually happening inside those. And what we'll actually be looking at, the astronomers tell me, is right into the heart of quasars, which with uh, the SST just appear as fuzzy or little bright dots on the, on the image. So very distant, uh, high brightness temperature objects. You would never see those with, in, with an optical telescope. In fact, a lot of the images you see with a radio telescope, you can't see because they don't emit in the optical domain. So you may take an optical picture of something and there's nothing there or there's nothing of interest there. You take a radio picture of it and you actually see something like maybe a supernova remnant or something like that. Okay. Up till, up till recently, this program, the Solar Radio Astronomy Program, was based at the Algonquin Radio Observatory in Ontario. And we're in the process of relocating the whole program to, the, to here, to the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. And over the next year or so, we're going to be modernizing and installing new equipment to this site. So what we're looking at here at the moment is probably the oldest working radio telescope in Canada, one that will be replaced over the next year, but despite its age, the data it's producing is important and very useful. Every day, during the day, the sun is tracked by an antenna um, outside the building, and that antenna helps us to receive all the radio emission from the sun and we can measure the strength of that radio emission using the electronics here. So the dials here are part of the system that controls the antenna so the antenna automatically follows the sun for as long as the sun's above the horizon. And the weak signals from the sun are very weak. So using these electronics, the weak signals are amplified and turned into voltages which are recorded on these chart recorders. The chart shows the strength of the radio emission uh, that we're receiving from the sun. The stronger the radio emission, the more the pen will move that way. So this chart is advancing at a speed of about one inch every hour, showing during the day the way the radio emission changes in strength with time. Now knowing the strength of that emission is very important, and we have to know that strength precisely. So periodically, we have to calibrate the equipment by going away from the sun and adding known strengths of homemade signal to the system. So here, um, just a couple of hours ago, we went through the process of calibrating the system. Now what we're looking for here are two things. One is the, stri the average strength of the emission during the day, which tells us something about the level of solar activity. The other thing we're looking at are solar flares, explosions um, caused by uh, the the reconnection of distorted magnetic fields in the solar atmosphere. And when these happen, this pen will move very rapidly over that way and over hours or a few minutes we will get tremendous bursts of emission here. Uh, we call those bursts. And when these occur, we normally try to warn other agencies who are interested in solar emission and also agencies who might be affected by solar activities such as hydro networks, and communications agencies, space agencies, and so on. For example, um, on March 10th, 1989, on a Friday afternoon, um, there was a tremendous explosion on the sun. And we received very strong emissions, both here and at the Algonquin Radio Observatory. And at the time of that explosion, an enormous cloud of material was shot out towards the Earth at speeds somewhere between 500 and 1,000 kilometers a second. And during the weekend, that material continued its journey out towards the Earth and arrived around 2 a.m. on Monday the 13th. And when that material hit the top of the Earth's magnetic field, there was a tremendous magnetic storm, and um, Hydro-Quebec received lots of induced currents due to the magnetic storm. Hydro-Quebec shut down, putting the province in the dark for about eight hours. Um, satellites were forced out of position due to heating of the top of the atmosphere. There were strong magnetic storms, communi communications were disrupted, and so on. 
And so that's a real example of the economic value of the sort of observation we're doing. What we try to do wherever possible is warn people of these events. And there were warnings sent out that Friday, but I think estimates of how important that event would be uh, were sort of undervalued. The Sun is the only star that's near enough to the Earth to really study. Uh, so although there are billions of stars in the universe, this is the only star that we can really have a look at. So it's the only example we have that we can really investigate in detail. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the Earth depends upon the Sun for heat and light, and the Earth is immersed in the outer parts of the solar atmosphere. So the Sun has very many effects upon the Earth. And understanding that relationship between the Earth and the Sun is very important, particularly as now we exploit our environment more fully, and our sensitivity to anything that might happen just becomes much, much more important to us. Well, the radio waves that we're observing um, are produced from very hot gas that's trapped in magnetic fields surrounding the sun. So the more of this magnetic activity there is, the more of this hot gas there is, so the more radio waves we receive. So what we're really monitoring um, in recording these radio waves from the sun is the gradual changing of the magnetic activity uh, surrounding the sun. And it's the magnetic activity that gives rise to solar flares, ejections of material, and even small changes in solar luminosity. So we are really keeping, if you like, a stethoscope on the magnetic machine of the sun. Sunspots are just one example of activity. Um, inside the sun, we have a tremendous, um, complex, a tremendously complex system of magnetic fields. And on occasion, these magnetic fields bubble up through the surface. And where they bubble up through the surface, um, they cause cooler patches we call sunspots. They also cause other, other uh, structures we associate with solar activity, but an obvious one is the sunspot. So when there's more of this magnetic bubbling, so to speak, there are more sunspots. But one of the things we really do not understand is why this level of solar activity varies over this 11-year cycle, how every 11 years there are many sunspots, many solar flares, a lot of activity, then five and a half years later or so, we're going through a solar minimum. What is happening inside the sun that makes the sun do this? That is something we don't understand. Although an important part, in fact the most important part of the program here, is warning other people about the sort of solar activity that might affect them, the sugar that makes this job so attractive is the chance to do some research of one's own. And what I'm really interested in is how the sun actually produces the radio emissions that we're, we're um, measuring, and also uh, what we can learn about this strange magnetic machine we are front we're confronted with. We know that the sun is a, uh, an enormous fusion reactor, generating energy by nuclear fusion. But what is not widely known is it is a very complicated magnetic machine, and this magnetic machine uh, has a lot of effects, uh, which teach us about the internal structure of the sun and teach us a lot, a lot about physics. And what is really exciting is a chance to really look at some nest of puzzles that the sun is and try to find out new things about it to really have a chance to see things that maybe nobody else has seen. In a sense, this is an advertisement for science, um, a chance to, for a little short while, have seen something or know something that nobody else on the earth knows.